<laughs> this is our lecture for chapter four. We're going to be talking about standardization and normality in stats and what that means. It's going to apply to both samples and individuals. So when we're thinking about this, I'm going to try to make that clear when we're talking about one versus another. What this is going to do is it's going to build on what we've already discussed, where we've talked about always plotting your data, uh, looking for the overall pattern, like the shape, center, and spread of any distribution, and looking for outliers, uh, calculating numeric summaries to describe the center and spread, like we did with a five number summary, box plots, things like that. And now sometimes the overall pattern of a large number of observations is so regular that we actually can describe it by a smooth curve. What that means is sometimes we can make a very slight assumption that will help us be able to understand our data more easily and be able to describe it in, in easier terms. So first thing to think about is what is a density curve? Now density curve is a curve that is always on or above the horizontal axis, so it's always above zero or at zero, and has an area of exactly one underneath it. So all the area under the curve is one. What this is going to help us do is it's going to describe the overall pattern of a distribution and highlights proportions of observations as the area. It's going to be very similar to histogram. So here, here's histograms with a density curve, the line uh, shown. So we have these three different distributions. This first one is basically a normal distribution, the histogram you can see. The density curve is just a smooth line that shows the overall distribution of that curve. Again, this one not so normal. It's, if you remember, this one is left skewed. The tail is pointing to the left or negative skewed. And you can see the density curve there. And this one you have a really highly skewed to the right with a lot of zeros. And this is the density curve for that one. So you see they're not exactly the same as a histogram. They're almost as if you're squinting and making it a little bit blurry and looking at the histogram and seeing the overall shape of it. So in the real world, uh, one pattern that pops up a lot is this normal curve. We've mentioned this a little bit before. It's a symmetric curve that kind of is shaped like a bell. What's interesting is even subpopulations often can have roughly normal distributions. So for example, this is shown the distribution for uh, Major League Baseball players, their heights since 1980. And what you're seeing is there's a pretty uh, normal curve to this with the center being somewhere between 72, 73, 74, somewhere in here. What's interesting is that is way above the average U.S. male height, which is right around here. So even though this is just a subpopulation and they happen to be a really tall bunch on average, they still have a normal distribution in that subpopulation. And this is something that you see quite frequently. One of the things we're going to rely on is this idea of a normal curve. But what's interesting is our sample doesn't always have to fit this description every time. So even though we see it a lot in practice, we're not going to always rely on it. And we'll, we'll talk about when and why uh, later on in this lecture. So the normal distribution, again, is that shape. Uh, many dependent variables are assumed to be normally distributed. So when we're talking about running correlations, regression, t-tests, and ANOVA, there it's roughly assuming the dependent variable to be normally distributed. It doesn't have to be exact. And the actual rules behind it are slightly different than the dependent variable having to be exactly normal. But it's an easy way to think about what 
your variables should look like in order to use a lot of these um, statistical procedures. This curve is also called the Gaussian distribution, uh, named after Carl Gauss. Uh, he um, did a lot of work behind it and found the, the equation that described it. Um, we're not going to go into all that detail right now, but know that Gaussian and normal distribution are synonyms. What's nice, when you do have a normal curve, what it allows us to do is understand where someone is in relation to everyone else in pretty simple terms. So first, when you have a normal uh, curve, we have what's called the 68, 95, and 99.7 rule. In the normal distribution, when the mean is mu, or in this case, at zero in, in these figures, or at x bar, with a certain standard deviation, whatever it is, approximately 68% of the observations fall within one standard deviation of the mean. Here, that's 68% are between here and here. So one standard deviation down from the mean and one standard deviation up. 68% of people are going to have scores between this point and this point. 95 are going to have scores between this point and this point. And 99.7% will have scores between this point and this point. So just knowing that, it, it can tell us a lot about where someone is in a distribution if we're talking about an individual. So for example, if someone scored three standard deviations above the mean, and we had a roughly normal distribution, we could know how many people scored below that person or how many people scored above that person just by using this information here. We're gonna be able to get very specific. We're gonna be able to find points in between here as well. But this is a great starting point to understand when we have a normal distribution, we have a lot of things we can explain really easily. We just need to know the mean and standard deviation and you can find out where someone is and how many people scored above them or below them on average. So each mean and standard deviation combination produces differently shaped normal distributions. They're all normal distributions, but they're going to look slightly different based on how big your standard deviation is and where your mean is. So for example, over here, you have a mean of two and a standard deviation of one, that's the shape for it. This is a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. This one's a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one and a half. So they all, although are very similar, they're different depending on how big your, your mean is, where it is, and how big your standard deviation is. It is a whole family of distributions, and the probability generating function for a normal distribution is this thing. So you literally could plug values in and understand the probability um, of an observation of your data. In this class, we're not going to be doing that. We're going to use computers to help us out, and we're going to have um, information from a table that tells us about probabilities. But this is the equation that uh, it stems from. With this information known, if you know the mean and standard deviation for a given variable in a given population, we can, for any given value of x, any value of that variable, we can compute the density or frequency of that value and thus determine its probability. So it doesn't really matter its exact shape. The properties uh, in terms of area under the curve per standard deviation unit are the same. So even if we have this shape or this shape, understanding what your standard deviation is and your mean 
you're going to be able to understand your distribution really well. So then the question becomes, in your data, do we have a normal distribution? And so we can check it in a couple ways. One is we can look at a histogram and is it a bell-shaped curve roughly? Maybe. This one's pretty close. Uh, the other one that we talked about was a QQ plot, which you see here. If the points are roughly along the line, then you have a rough normal distribution. And in this case, it looks like we do. It looks pretty normal. If we want to use this information, we need to have a normal distribution. So in summary, the normal distribution is a special type of distribution. There's lots of different versions of them depending on your mean and standard deviation. But having a normal distribution allows us to do some things to understand individuals and even samples, which we'll talk about later, in a really concrete, simple way that otherwise we don't have the ability to do. So normality is useful for that. Now related but separate idea is what we call a z-score. This is what's called standardizing. It basically converts a value to what we call a standard score, thus the standardizing name. Z-score is another term for it. It's all, they're all synonyms. The equation to do this is you take your value, whatever value it is, minus the mean and divide by the standard deviation. Or in a sample, if you don't know the population mean and standard deviation, then you use your, your value again, minus the sample mean divided by the sample standard deviation. And that gives you a z-score. One thing that's really important about z-scores is it doesn't change your distribution at all. It changes the values of your distribution. So these are two, this is a variable before it was standardized and a variable after it was standardized. And if you look at the two distributions, they are the same. Standardizing it did not make the distribution more normal. It just kept it the exact same. The only thing that changed is now the mean is zero and one standard deviation is one unit here where this one is just in the original unit so this isn't the mean necessarily right here or here and these aren't necessarily one standard deviation units so this is the original units and the standardized units still the same information's in there but the standardized one is now centered at zero and each unit is one standard deviation. So z-scores are in what are called SD units, or standard units, and they represent the standard deviation distances away from the mean. In other words, if a z-score is negative 0.5, then it is one half of a standard deviation below the mean. If a z-score was one, that means it's one standard deviation above the mean. So why do we use this? Well, that information right there tells us a lot about where a person is in the distribution. So if we come back to this example, if I said they scored 100, without knowing the mean and the standard deviation, you're like, is that good? Is that bad? If you didn't have information on all this, it doesn't tell you anything about where they are in the distribution. Is, are, do they score above most people, lower than most people? But if I said instead they were negative two z-score or negative two standard units, then immediately you know they're two standard deviations below the mean, which is probably not great. No matter what distribution you have, that's probably pretty, pretty low. So a z-score, even though it doesn't change the distribution, does give us additional pieces of information. Another thing it can do is it can compare z-scores from two or more variables. So we could have variables measured in different units, and it would make it really hard to compare them. So if I said this guy was 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighed 200 pounds, we can't directly compare those. Is that person 
extreme on e either of those, we wouldn't be able to compare them directly. But if we do z-scores, we can see, do they have a high z-score on height or weight? And that would tell us a little bit more about where that person fits in in the general population. And again, I keep emphasizing that standardizing does not normalize the data. And this is important because it's a common mis- understanding that when you standardize suddenly the distribution becomes normal but that's not true so z-score is going to tell us certain pieces of information no matter what but if we have a normal curve the z-score is going to tell us even more information so let's apply this let's say we know that 95 percent of students at a school are between 1.1 and 1.7 meters tall and assuming the data is normally distributed, which in a lot of cases with height it is, we can ask what the mean and standard deviation of the sample are. So we know mean is going to be the center point. So we can, we can draw that out. We can say the mean is here. We know 1.7 is up here and 1.1 is here. We know that it's two standard deviations away because we're saying 95% of all students at this school are between those ranges. If we come back to this, 95% of the observations fall within two standard deviations of the mean. So let's come back. So the mean is in the middle. So we can actually find where is the middle of these two. The middle is going to be the mean of them, and so we can just add them up, divide by two. So our mean is 1.4. That's the middle of these two. Next, we can find out what the standard deviation is. Now that we know what the mean is, we can say, okay, we know 95% are within plus or minus two standard de deviations. So the difference between 1.7 and 1.1 is going to be four standard deviations. We can count those. So we can say we're starting at 1.1. So one, two, three, four. So we want to find out how much of a difference this is and this, etc. And if we do the math there, we find out the standard deviation is 0.15. So our mean is 1.4 and the standard deviation is 0.15. So just by knowing this information right here, we can know what the mean is and the standard deviation. We also could go the other direction. So we could say something like, we know the mean is 1.4 and our standard deviation is 0.15. And we could ask the question, uh, what, where are 95% of the people located? And you could then go the other direction and find 1.1 and 1.7. All right, so now we have another situation. We're going to calculate a z-score. So let's say you have a friend, uh, and that friend is 1.85 meters tall. And if you're anything like me as an American, you have no idea what that means. It's maybe it's over six feet. I don't know. But let's say it's 1.85 meters tall. And we know the class. The class, the mean was 1.4, and the standard deviation was 0.15 from our last example. Now the question is, how far is 1.85 from the mean? In other words, how many standard deviations away is that? So we can calculate this first by saying, okay, we know the mean is at 1.4. This person is above the mean somewhere at 1.85. So where are they in terms of the z-score? So we can use our z calculation and we can say x, that's our friend here, 1.85. The mean, which is 1.4, and our standard deviation, which is 0.15. So we can divide all those. And what we get is three standard deviations above average. In other words, this person is really tall. 
there's three standard deviation units above the mean. And if you remember, if we come to here, what we said is 99.7% are between three and negative three, which means that person is right here, which tells us that there's only 0.15% uh, that scored above him. Because what we know is that 1.5% is above here and 1.5, or 0.15 I mean percent is below here. So 0.15 and 0.15 are outside of the threes because we know 99.7 are between them. So we actually can say, well, only 0.15% is above three. So if this is a normal distribution, not only can we say that that person is three standard deviations above the mean, but we also can say the probability of being taller than that in this sample, or the probability of being shorter than that. So the probability of being shorter is 99.85. So 99.85% of the students in the class would be below this person, and only 0.15% would be above. To find that when they don't land exactly on one, two, three, so that we can look at that uh, 68, 95, and 99.7 rule, we actually can use the Z table. And the Z table is going to tell us that information, but for values that aren't right on those cut points. So with the Z table, we can find more specific values. If we, let's say we found a person that was uh, 0.1 uh, Z units uh, above the, the mean. So what, what we can do is use the Z table. And at first this is probably a little bit confusing. But the idea is that this will tell us a probability depending on where we're at. So let's say our z-score was uh, 0.1. What this column is telling us is the probability from the mean to z. So it's this area. What that means is point. 0398 uh, of the sample is between the mean and 0.1, if that's what we're looking. Which means uh, about 4% are between the mean and a Z of 0.1. We also can look at beyond the Z, so from our point above it and that's this column. So if we come from point one and go over here, about 46% of the population is above that point. And so we can do this for any value, and we're gonna get some practice in just a moment. We could pick any value of Z up to four. Uh, when you're beyond four, it's just so small that uh, it's basically a constant after that, so uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but let's say uh, a z-score of 3. So it's just like the one we talked about, and we talked about the proportions on the left and right of it. But if someone scored a 3, the mean to z is 49.87. So 49.87% is from this point to our value here. So this line would actually be far over here if it was a three. So between the mean and there is almost 50%. So what's above it? And it's 0 0.0013. So very close to what our approximation was when we were talking about it. So there's approximately 0.13% uh, that would score above a person that was at three, a uh, z-score of three. 
So let's get a few practice examples in. Uh, again, go through these fairly quickly now. Uh, you can pause and rewind all you need to, but I recommend practicing. The homework has some of these practices as well to help out. Let's start the z-score for a student that is 1.63 meters tall. So a z-score for that kind of person, that's the blue here. So it's 1.63 minus the mean, which is 1.4, divided by the standard deviation. That gives us a, a z-score of 1.53. So the z-score is 1.53 for that person. You can actually do the reverse and find the height of a student with a z-score of negative 2.65. That's right here. It's just a backwards calculation. So you're, you have the mean minus uh, your, um, your z-score times your standard deviation, and that gives you your uh, height, which in this case is just exactly one. Uh, so that's in the original units, which would be meters. The percent rank of a student that's 1.5 meters tall. So that one you're going to solve for the z-score first. In this case, the z-score is 0.87. And from there, we're going to find out uh, the percentile. And so we're going to look at the table. We're going to find out how many scored above that person. And if you look at the table, that's going to tell us it's 0.1922 from the Z table, which means there's only uh, about 21% uh, or, I mean, 19% that's above, which means 81% is below. So when we talk about percentile rank, we're going to always be talking about who's below that. And so in this case, it's about the 81st percentile. And then the last one the 90th percentile for students' heights. So we actually can start with uh, the percentile. We can say, okay, we know if we're at the 90th percentile that 0.1 is above that point, and we can work backwards. So we can look at the table and find out where is that point. Well, it turns out that's a z-score of 1.28, and we can solve that backwards just like we did here with 1.4, plus, because this is a positive 1.28, times our standard deviation, and that gives us 1.59. So we know on, with this distribution, with the mean and standard deviation that we know of, that a person at the 90th percentile would be approximately 1.59 meters tall.